actually grew up on a farm in Iowa and uh, went to a small consolidated school district with uh, 39 high school. In my class, there were 13, which is the biggest class that ever graduated from the school. Three miles, our farm was three miles from the, from the school. Uh, it was a typical little Iowa farm in those days. All livestock, all the grain that we grew went right back to the livestock. Cattle, hogs, horses, uh, hogs, chickens, and so forth. And I was on the farm living, of course, when Pearl Harbor happened. I remember distinctly like just about everybody did in those days when Pearl Harbor occurred on a Sunday afternoon. And uh, I immediately began thinking about going into the service. I had always been fascinated by airplanes. About once a month, maybe one would wander over the farm and you could hear it coming and see it disappear <laughs> in the distance. Uh, and that always fascinated me. So in the week following Pearl Harbor, I went to a recruiting station and told them that I wanted to be in the Navy and wanted to be a Navy pilot. True to their word, about a month later, I received a bus ticket and instructions on how to go to the Naval Air Station in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And when I arrived up there, uh, they gave me a complete physical, mostly eye test and what they call the Schneider, which is a blood pressure thing that they want to make sure of your blood pressure. And I passed those okay, so they said go on home and we'll call you back for uh, to come back and have a, a written test uh, before we can select you. So I went back home and wasn't but a week or two later, back I went and took my written test and passed that. And this was, a, this was probably near the 1st of May. Then near the end of, end of the, let's see who knows, middle of May, I received a call and said to report, I was told to report to the Wool Chamberlain Naval Air Station, which was Minneapolis Airport at that time. And I arrived up there on a day and immediately uh, got involved in the program. I, we had a month of ground school. After a month of ground school and a lot of physical activity, uh, we started to fly. I, I don't know, early on, uh, as I said, I was, I was really, I was kind of anxious to get off the farm, too. You know, in those days, that's hard work. Uh, I'd go down the field in the morning at 4 o'clock in the morning and get, bring the cattle in, dairy cattle in, then have to milk 17 cows day and night, morning and night, uh, and then work all day on the farm. And I was ready for a change, so... So I guess in a way, I, I hate to describe it in terms of being fortunate, but for me it was. It gave me a chance to get off the farm into the Navy. Um, I was at Minneapolis uh, for three months and went through part of the primary flight, had no problems. We started out with 26 in my class. And incidentally, it was the last class that went straight to flight training without going to pre uh, to uh, to um, can't think of the term now. Physical education program they had, where people had to go through a month of that before they went to flight training. I missed that. And so then, in mid-August, uh, I had or I had soloed, and was one that was asked to go on to Corpus Christi. That was the advanced flight training. Out of 26 that started the program, 19 of us went on to uh, advanced training at Corpus. Corpus Christi, uh, I, we finished our primary flight training. We had basic training. Uh, we had advanced training in SNJs, or as the Army calls them, AT6s. And and that's where we learned to uh, fly a plane with wheels up 
you know, retractable flight gear and so on. And so actually from the start of the program, from my first flight, for, from the time I went into the Navy till I got my wings and received my commission was exactly seven months. And I've never heard of anybody that went through any faster. Now there may be somebody, but I've not heard of anybody. I finished my training at Jacksonville. This was uh, early June of 1943. And I was sent directly from there to the Great Lakes, Lake Michigan, Chicago, uh, for having my first carrier checkouts. Got to uh, Glenview Naval Air Station. The station was about, I don't know, 15, 20 miles from Lake Michigan, out in the out in the lake were two carriers called the Sable and the Wolverine. They were both converted old passenger ships that they'd attached the deck to the ships. Uh, and those two ships provided the way for thousands of naval aviators to receive, receive their first carrier landings. So on a given day, after doing a lot of field carrier landing practice, I proceeded out to the carrier with some others and uh, I really didn't have any problem. I, I completed eight carrier landings and that was that. I do remember after making that first carrier landing, I shouted and yelled in the cockpit, I can do it, I can do it, <laughs> make that carrier landing. So then when I finished uh, the two or three weeks that I was at Glenview, I was assigned to a uh, squadron, uh, Air Group 2, uh, VT-2 Torpedo Bomber Squadron in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. So I had a few days at home at that time and then went right on to Providence, Rhode Island and joined the squadron. Uh, and we, we trained there all summer. Uh, we were originally designated as a night outfit, and all our flying was at night. Navigation, cross country, uh, bombing, and torpedo runs, whatever. Uh, and then in August, they suddenly, they, they said suddenly that, well, you're going to be a day outfit. So from all night flying, we started flying during the day. And then the carrier Hornet arrived in Pearl Harbor with Air Group 15 aboard. Uh, on the way out from the States, um, the uh, pilots had a, quite a number of accidents, particularly the dive bomber pilots. And Captain Browning was so unhappy with the Air Group that he uh, said, I will not take this air group to sea. So that gave us our chance. Air group was put off and, uh, and all at once we had a carrier. Uh, we were still on the heel, but we immediately flew to back to Oahu, to Honolulu. And after about a week, the carrier put to sea and uh, we flew our planes aboard and, and we were off on our way to combat. Early in March, uh, the carrier Hornet put to sea. Everybody had been loaded aboard except the pilots. And after the carrier was out to sea for a few miles, we flew our planes aboard for the first time. And as I recall, I don't remember any accident at all on those first carrier landings aboard the carrier. And we were on our way. We had no idea at that time exactly where we were headed, except we knew we were going out to the combat area in the Pacific somewhere. Uh, after we were well underway, we were told that our first combat mission was going to be at Palau. Uh, as you may recall, later on the war, Palau was invaded. And we were also in on that uh, combat mission. We proceeded on to uh, the Palau Islands, and I think it was two days later, we came to the target area. And uh, the night before, we began to be hassled by Japanese planes. And on the 
first morning that we were going to attack the islands. As I said before, I was the skipper's wingman, so we were always the first flight off in the morning. These were always pre-dawn takeoffs, pitch black. Sometimes the carrier would be hiding under a rain squall uh, to avoid detection, easy detection. So uh, I was up about three o'clock in the morning that morning, and we had uh, I couldn't eat breakfast, first flight, first mission. Gathered in the ready room, we got our instructions. Uh, our mission was to drop aerial mines in the harbor. We had to go right into the harbor and drop aerial mines. And incidentally, this is the only time that there were any aerial mines ever dropped in World War II. So uh, we got up and you can imagine, uh, we're supposed to circle at 1,500 feet in complete blackness to, to join up. Uh, joining up on those early morning flights was worse than a combat mission ever was. But we finally got together and uh, we arrived over the target almost at daybreak, and that was the ideal. And we, in the meantime, we were being harassed by some Zero fighters. One of our guys did shoot down, one of our uh, tail gunners shot down a Zero fighter. Because uh, we, I, I don't know why, but we didn't seem to have any fighter cover that morning. So we were being harassed with the Zero. We were ducking in and out of the clouds. And as we made our approach, uh, the islands have these really high hills. And we had to go right down between two high hills to make our approach into the harbor. And of course, there was anti-aircraft fire on both sides firing down at us. And we got in there and laid our mines and uh, got out of there. And on that particular flight, we lost uh, we lost two bomber two torpedo bomber pilots shot down. They were picked up by a sub. In those days, submarines were always in the area to pick up down flyers. So they were picked up safely. And meantime, back on the carrier, uh, on that early morning flight, one of the guys wingtip caught the island structure on the carrier, and he spun off into the water. And he and his crew were both killed. Uh, so as a result of that first mission on Palau, we lost, I don't know, four or five planes. And, uh, but we accomplished what we started out, play mines in the harbor. On the second flight of the day, uh, our captain that time was a guy by the name of Browning, and he, he, he wouldn't give us enough flight deck. And so if your engine had any problems at all, you're very likely you're going to go in the drink. And so on the second flight of the day, as I started down the deck, my engine coughed a time or two. And I hit the end of the deck and 2,000 pound load and it sank towards the water and I I tried everything, you know, I melted the flaps up and down, I put the wheels up and and I was able, able to keep the plane in the air for about two or three miles. And the air group commander later on said, boy, he said, you were making a week like a motorboat from your prop. And finally the engine just gave out and so I had to drop into the water. And uh, I immediately got out on the wing, got the raft out, and our two guys got out of the back, and we were in, in the raft and hardly got wet. And then a destroyer came along and picked us up. From there, uh, we proceeded to uh, truck, which at that time was one of the big bases of the Jap Japanese had, and which they fortunately decided never to invade, but they did want to uh, put it in a condition so it wouldn't be useful to the Japanese. So that was our next mission that I was involved with. Uh, on the day we approached truck, there was a overcast sky. And as, uh, again, of course, I was on the first mission with the skipper. <clears throat> and as we approached the island, 
it was completely covered by cloud cover. And all at once, uh, we spied a little hole in the clouds, and everybody started pouring down through this hole to the targets below. And, of course, we were being met by any aircraft fire. Incidentally, uh, after the first mission or two, uh, we never really bothered that much by zeros because our fighters were so good they they were able to take care of those guys. But we did have heavy anti-aircraft fire throughout the whole time I was out there. So the anti-aircraft fire was heavy. Uh, when I pulled up out of my dive and looked around, I saw five of our planes on fire. And uh, when I got, eventually I got back to the carrier, I found out that uh, there was a, like on all missions, they put a submarine out in the ocean away from the target a ways. And when pilots are shot down, uh, the idea is that they will be rescued by a submarine, which for most part they were. And in this particular case, there were 26 pilots and air crew that were rescued by this submarine. There were that many shot down, and including one of our guys, Scotty Scammell and his crew uh, were shot down inside the island structure itself, and they were able to escape over the the reef and get about out to the ocean and a raft and were picked up by the sub. So uh, there was a good reason why they bypassed truck and they should have bypassed a lot of other islands out there. They should have, it's not my just saying it, but a lot of other people in retrospect said Palau should have never been invaded and some of those other islands. They should have just simply been bypassed. Our fighter group on the carrier Hornet was the top fighter outfit in the Pacific until one other carrier went out a little later and they, they got a few more planes, but not many. So we had five, we had five aces in a day, our fighter group. And uh, practically every pilot in the squadron was, a, was an ace. Uh, a lot of those planes were shot down. I'm deviating a little bit here. A lot of those planes were shot down because we we went to the Bonin Islands on four different occasions. And every time we went up to the Bonin Islands, uh, the fighter planes feasted on Japanese planes. So that was a good part of it. Our last missions were over the Philippines. And those flights were up to six hours long, which is long. Normally our combat flight would be anywhere from two to three hours, but these were six hours. And uh, I was involved in six flights there. On the very last flight, any aircraft fire was extremely heavy around Manila. It was heavy everywhere we went, but around Manila was extremely heavy. Uh, I was assigned to the last flight before we were to come home. And I led a group of nine planes in over the, over the target. And as we made our approach at 14,000 feet, we began to pick up a lot of anti-aircraft fire. And uh, just as I was, it was so heavy, you know, it was coming, we could smell it in the cockpit, it was all over the place. But anyway, as I lined up the group to start into the dive on the target, my wingman got hit head on. And uh, I immediately went into my dive and my tail gunner could look back and see what was happening. Two of the guys got out of the plane, but one went in with the plane obviously because we didn't see a third parachute. And whatever happened to uh, them, we've never heard whether they were killed in their parachute going down. You may recall or may not recall, but pilots were considered criminal, war criminals. And Japanese uh, would kill people immediately, sometimes after they were captured. So what happened to them, I don't know. But that was, that was my very last mission. The carrier, uh, was awarded the Presidential Unit Citation. Of course, all everybody aboard received that as well. I I was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross, uh, seven Air Medals, Presidential Unit Citation. 
and uh, escape with my life. So um, our our uh, combat missions ended then just before the Battle of Lady Gulf. We came home just ahead of that, and and we were all happy to get back to the states. Of course, uh, it was a grand day when we sailed under the the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco and arrived back in the States. And just briefly, 